Hey everyone, this is Richie086, and I am going to be showing you today how to uh, install and configure a tool called VirtualBox, which is a tool used to uh, run virtual machines on Windows, Linux, or Mac. So, um, I'm going to assume that you do not already have VirtualBox installed. Uh, so, in order to get VirtualBox installed, we have to go to virtualbox.org go to downloads oh, it also looks like you can uh, use this on Solaris, that's cool um, so what you're going to want to do next is uh, depending on if you're running VirtualBox on Linux, uh, OS X or Windows you're going to choose the appropriate download, I'm currently using Windows 7 64-bit so I'm going to choose the Windows hosts keep come on. give that a moment to download So um, while that's downloading, I'll just go ahead and kind of roughly explain what this tutorial will kind of encompass. So um, basically what I want to show uh, you how to do is how to create a, <clears throat> a new virtual machine in uh, Oracle VirtualBox, how to configure it, like if you have a multi-processor uh, uh, computer, how to configure it and uh, how to assign different processors and different uh, amounts of RAM, how to attach a, uh, an image to actually be able to boot and install an operating system. So um, if you're new to VirtualBox, hopefully this will be a good tutorial for you. So it looks like the file is done downloading, so I'm going, going to go ahead and run it. Click on Next. Now, um, I usually just leave all this stuff uh, default. There's no particular reason why I would suggest to uncheck any of these. Like, they're all pretty much, you know, things you might end up using. So, just click Next. And it's going to create a shortcut on the desktop. Okay. And it's now warning me that the uh, my network interfaces are going to temporarily go down. Because what it does is it creates a pseudo interface or a uh, software, basically, interface uh, for use by the uh, virtual machines. Okay, that's going. As you can see here, uh, some's over here listed on the left. Uh, so what I want you to do uh, in order to create a new virtual machine, I should also mention that uh, we're going to be doing uh, Ubuntu. I'm going to create a new Ubuntu uh, virtual machine here. So to create a new virtual machine, click on New. This is basically uh, a wizard that you know walks you through the process. So I'm going to click Next. It's going to ask me for a name. I already have one called Ubuntu, so uh, I'm going to call this one Ubuntu 2. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but as soon as I started typing the, the word Ubuntu, the OS type automatically changed to Linux and Ubuntu down here, because it was originally set to Windows and Windows XP. So it's a nice little feature. And then it shows you a little icon that's going to use to represent that particular installation of that virtual machine, which is like basically a part of the Ubuntu logo. Click Next. So here is where you set the memory size. So this is really depending on how much RAM you actually have in your computer. Um, obviously, since I have that, to adjust this virtual machine. So if you click on the uh, slider bar, just click twice, and it'll move up and in you know increments basically doubling it in regular RAM size so it's going to be you know, 512 1024 uh, you know and so on so I'm going to click next this is asking me if I want to create a new virtual hard disk um, to use with this virtual machine or use an existing hard disk use an existing hard disk is only if you already have um, a virtual machine image you want to use um, you're, uh, if you're creating a new totally new Virtual machine, you're going to select create a new disk. Click on next. Um, this is basically the screen is asking uh, what type of uh, file do you want me to create uh, for use in VirtualBox? Because there's a couple different options here. So VirtualBox VirtualBox disk image is the default that VirtualBox uses. Virtual machine disk or VMDK is another very common um, uh, virtual machine format. Virtual hard disk and Parallels hard disk. Parallels is another um, uh, virtualization program. Uh, it's comparable to VirtualBox, but um, I do believe the full version is not free, so it's something I have to pay for, unfortunately. So, I'm going to leave it at the default, the VirtualBox, di di VirtualBox disk image. Click Next. 
And this is asking if I want to dynamically allocate or basically um, have the volume automatically expand to a particular size uh, uh, if I start running out of space. Or do I want to create a disk that is a fixed size? Now, if you create a disk that is a fixed size, it usually takes a little bit longer to actually complete this process because it actually has to take a part of your hard drive and... Um, you know, partition it and format it and allocate it for just that virtual machine. If you do dynamically allocate it, I think by default it'll, it'll give you a 8 gigabyte drive, um, which is usually good for, for most situations, yeah, 8 gigs. So, And if you wanted to uh, set the actual physical file location, like say if you have a large uh, backup driver like I do, I have a network attached storage drive, um, you could select you know, whatever location you want, if you click on this little folder icon over here, and it'll let you select a location other than your C drive, uh, just in case you wanted to store the virtual machine somewhere else. So I'm just going to leave it where it is. And I'm going to increase it to 16 gigs, just for the fun of it. So I'm going to click Next. And so this is just kind of a summary of all of the options that I picked in the previous screens. Click on Create. And now you see Ubuntu 2 over here uh, showing up, which is the machine we just created. Now, if I were to just double-click on this right now, it's going to notice that I don't have a um, an operating system image or you know an ISO uh, basically mounted to this virtual machine. And it's going to be like, well, what do you want me to boot from? Because we don't have any idea what it is that you actually want to load. Um, this is usually not how I would go about doing it, so let me hit cancel real quick. And when it tries to load, it's going to say no bootable medium found in system halted, just like a computer would if you, you know, told it to not boot from the hard drive, but look for uh, like a CD-ROM or a floppy drive and have it, uh, if it doesn't find anything, it's going to say, hey, no operating system found, I can't do anything. So let's close that, power off. So in order to actually configure... Uh, both the actual image settings are, are the uh, the operating system we want to load the image of that. If you right-click on that virtual machine, go to settings, and here are all the settings for that particular virtual machine. So I'm going to go over some. I'm going to pretty much, you know, at least uh, briefly describe all of these options. So this is the name, the type of operating system, and the version of the operating system. Uh, the advanced tab, show at top of screen, mini toolbar. Basically, once you launch the virtual machine, it'll show a, uh, a little toolbar at the top of the screen if you're in full screen to maximize, minimize, and there's some other functionality once you actually are, have the virtual machine loaded that you can interact with. But that's not real important for right now. Description is just if you want to type a text description. Um, here again, you could set the base memory, or uh, like we did when we first configured the machine. I have still, I just usually set it to 1024, uh, or basically one gig of RAM. Um, you can actually tell it what boot order to pick. So let's say you wanted it to actually look for a floppy before it looked for your hard drive, or you know, basically like what whatever boot sequence you want, just like in a BIOS on a computer. Processor tab is kind of cool. So since I have a uh, multi-processor, multi-core machine. If I want to, I could set the number of processors. I could actually allocate two of my processors, or two of my cores, to processing uh, data for this virtual machine. It'll run faster. And um, it really kind of depends on what you're doing. Sometimes when I'm messing around with Windows Server stuff, I'll, I'll increase one of the virtual machines to be using a full you know, both cores on a processor, but for right now I'm just going to leave it at one CPU, but it's a good thing to know that that it's there if you have a multiprocessor machine or a multi-core machine. And acceleration, this is kind of advanced stuff that we're not really going to need to go into. The display memory. So um, this is another thing where um, you not really uh, necessary for this tutorial. It's basically allowing you to set the amount of video memory that this virtual machine will use. You can enable 3D acceleration. I've never really gotten it to work, which is, you know, uh, basically your virtual machine will have 3D graphics capabilities, be able to actually uh, process some some of the higher level graphical stuff that operating systems can do. And so 
And remote display is another thing on the, it's kind of beyond the scope of this tutorial. It's a thing where you can um, set up a way for people to connect remotely to this uh, virtual machine and manage it that way. So here's an important one, the storage, uh, storage tab over here. So um, if you look here where it says storage tree, it says IDE controller, SATA controller. And right here it says Ubuntu 2 VDI. That's basically, that's a 16 gig disk image I created that we're going to use to install Ubuntu. However, um, the computer still has no idea how or, you know, what to use to boot from. And if I don't tell it what to boot from, when I first start it, it's going to ask me what to boot from. So the easiest way to do this is over here where it says CD DVD drive. Click on the little disk icon. And I actually already have, oh, maybe it's not in the list anymore. So where it says choose a virtual CD DVD disk title, it's basically asking you to select a disk image. So I'm going to go over to my software drive and go into my Linux folder. As you can see, I have quite a bit of stuff. So, And I'm going to do... Let's do Ubuntu 10.10. So when uh, it boots up, basically it'll just have this, uh, the actual, the hard drive image uh, with your installed version of uh, Ubuntu on it instead of uh, it trying to load the actual bootable ISO up here because that will just bring you back into another live CD session. So let's go ahead and click OK. Uh, no, not OK yet. So audio, it's pretty simple. Basically, you can choose uh, Windows Direct Sound or Null Audio Driver. Basically, what the virtual machine does is actually it emulates all of the hardware that a regular computer would have to make it so... Um, most operating systems will have a driver or something it can use um, to basically, you know, make the hardware work. Because, you know, if you build a computer out of just random parts, uh, especially with Windows, sometimes you're going to have to go and find drivers, and sometimes that could be a pain. A lot of times with Linux, it'll load, a, uh, you know, a default driver for most devices, and it'll usually work. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Sometimes with networking cards especially, it seems to uh, sometimes you, you might be better off installing or sometimes need to uh, a, a a driver for that particular type of network card. So this is a, kind of an important one, the network tab, where it says enable network adapter, attach to. So there's a bunch of different options in here for how you want, uh, however you want uh, this virtual machine to actually connect to your network. Now if you select NAT, what's going to happen is uh, when you first set up VirtualBox, it uh, added, I mentioned something before about a pseudo interface. Basically what the NAT does is it kind of connects to that pseudo interface and um, it'll be on a, a separate uh, network that, than the rest of your computers, but it'll be connected to the internet. It's kind of weird. It's like a NAT inside of your local area network, which is probably already NATed. So, you know, that's like that's the default, and you could leave it at that, but there are certain things that, when it's NATed, are going to be hard to do if you want to connect to it from an actual real computer on your network. Um, bridged adapter is usually what I use. What bridged adapter does is it'll allow you to select one of the adapters in your machine. As you can see, I have two gigabit Ethernet connections and a wireless card. Um, basically, what that allows you to do is it'll share or piggyback on top of... Um, your current, um, your current, uh, the actual host PC's, you know, internet connection. It'll get its own IP address, and it'll actually be on the same um, network as the rest of the computers on your on your network, the actual real computers. Um, so that's, that's usually what I use as the bridge adapter, just to eliminate any issues with trying to connect to services or trying to just do anything networking related. Um, this option, the internal network, what that does is it's an internal network that only this that only your virtual machine will be on, and no other computers will be able to contact it. So, I guess in a really particular situation, that might be good, but I've never really used it. Host only adapter uh, uses that uh, pseudo interface that I spoke about before. I've never really used it, so I'm not real sure how it's actually used. And generic driver. Oh, that's, that's a new one. I've never actually used that name. It looks like you could basically create your own type of network card or and give it a name and then 
it'll you'll let you choose an adapter. I've eh, I've never really used it. I'd say it's outside the scope of uh, this particular tutorial. So let's go to bridge adapter, and everything looks good there. What's really cool too is you can have a, uh, multiple. Uh, network adapters on this virtual machine if you wanted to. Say if you were messing around with some server stuff, you could actually have two network adapters that aren't even physical. They're they're all in software. But you can still use them inside of that virtual machine. Say in Windows, if you were setting up a uh, remote access and routing server, DHCP, Active Directory, that kind of thing. So, serial ports... Um, Basically, this will allow you to communicate with, uh, have a virtual machine communicate over serial on your computer to uh, a device via the via the software here. So, and there's up to two virtual serial ports. Never really used this myself, but um, I can see it being handy in particular situations. Um, this is will enable you to connect to USB devices in VirtualBox. Uh, it's kind of problematic at times. Depends on what you're trying to do, but. I've got it to work for certain things, and certain things it doesn't really seem to work for, and is also kind of outside of the scope of this uh, tutorial. And shared folders is if you wanted to basically set uh, mount points um, that are accessible to that machine. Like I, I'm going to guess that that is mainly used for if you're using like uh, maybe the internal network or the uh, host-only adapter. But um, I've all, never really used this option, so click OK. And that should be all we need to do. Now if we double click on our virtual machine over here, it'll open. Full screen this. And as you can see, it's starting to load Ubuntu. Uh, full screen. So just like it would if I had a physical computer and a uh, you know a, a burned ISO onto a disk which is bootable, it would be doing the same thing right now. It'd be booting from the CD-ROM drive instead of a virtual CD-ROM drive, and it would uh, start loading Ubuntu. And this process will take a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. Well, it's a fun error. Anyways, I'm going to pause the video until we get into the actual install screen. So. All right, so now Ubuntu is loading. I didn't have to do anything. Basically, as soon as I paused it, it booted right into the graphical user interface. And it's prompting me if I want to try Ubuntu, which means it's going to be a live CD, or if I want to install it onto the hard drive. So I'm going to go ahead and install it real quick. And it says for best results, please ensure the computer has, you know, at least a good amount of... Uh, hard drive space because it's going to need to install a bunch of files. It's plugged into a power source as a PC or desktop, so I'm fine with that. And it is connected to the internet, and I am connected to the internet. And I'm going to tilt the download updates while installing, and I definitely want to install third-party software. So download updates while installing should be pretty self-explanatory. Basically, while it is uh, doing the install, it's going to go out and get the updated packages. And install this third-party software, uh, things like uh, if you want to listen to MP3s or particular um, things that might not necessarily be free or open source, uh, might be under a different license or might have some kind of proprietary code. really depends how much of a purist you are when it comes to uh, Linux if you want to stay away from all the, uh, the non-free stuff. I personally am a huge fan of open source, but I'm not so strict that I'm not going to use... Uh, Stuff that might work better in a lot of instances than, uh, than you know, use the open source equivalent, which sometimes can be problematic. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So it all kind of depends. So I would I would definitely choose that, especially if you are new to Linux. And I'm going to click forward. Oh, next screen, it's saying erase the, use the entire disk. Let me full screen this. View, full screen. Um, basically, it's it's not talking about like your main C drive. It's talking about that virtual disk that it has allocated for this virtual machine that we created. I think it was uh, 16 gigs. So yeah, I'm going to erase and use the entire disk. And... Yeah, so 17.2 gigs VBox hard disk. Make sure that... Uh, you know, it says something about a virtual hard disk if you're doing this a virtual box, obviously. 
and we're going to install now. And that's pretty much it. Installing Ubuntu is very, very, very simple. It's one of the uh, one of the most polished Linux distributions I've ever used. Uh, let's go ahead and choose our time zone.